After the Battle of Chancellorsville, Lee gave a congratulatory address to the Army. While this glorious victory entitles you to the praises and gratitude of the nation, we are especially called upon to return our grateful thanks to the only giver of victory for the single deliverance he wrought. It is therefore earnestly recommended that the troops unite on Sunday next in ascribing unto the Lord of the hosts the glory due unto his name. Lee was now launching another raid northward into Pennsylvania. On June 30th, the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac touched by chance at Gettysburg. The opening battle began on July 1st with the Confederate Army attacking Union troops on McPherson Ridge, west of town. On July 2nd, the battle lines were drawn up in two sweeping arcs. The main portions of both armies were nearly one mile apart on parallel ridges. Union forces on Cemetery Ridge and Confederate forces on Seminary Ridge to the west. Lee ordered an attack against both Union flanks. James Longstreet's thrust on the Federal left turned the base of Little Round Top into a shambles and left the area strewn with dead and wounded. On July 3rd, Lee's artillery opened a two-hour bombardment against the Federal lines on Cemetery Hill. Then, some 12,000 Confederates began a one-mile advance across open fields toward the Federal center in an attack known as Pickett's Charge. There were more than 5,000 casualties in one hour. With the repulse of Pickett's charge, the Battle of Gettysburg was over. The Army of Northern Virginia had lost a devastating 28,000 men, about one-third of their force while Meade lost 23,000, about one-fourth of his effective force. On August 13, 1863, Lee issued the following order. The President of the Confederate States has, in the name of the people, appointed August 21st as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. All military duties, except such as are absolutely necessary, will be suspended. Soldiers, we have sinned against Almighty God. We have forgotten His single mercies and have cultivated a revengeful, haughty, and boastful spirit. We have not remembered that the defenders of a just cause should be pure in His eyes. God is our only refuge and our strength. Chaplain J. William Jones wrote, I can never forget the effect produced by the reading of this order at the solemn services of that memorable fast day. The work of grace among the troops widened and deepened and went gloriously on until over 15,000 soldiers professed repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ as his personal savior. How far these results were due to this fast day or to the quiet influence and fervent prayers of the commanding general, eternity alone shall reveal. Mine Run, November 1863. 
the Army of Northern Virginia confronted Union General Meade, and an attack was imminent. General Lee, along with a number of officers, was riding down the line of battle when they came upon a party of soldiers engaged in a prayer meeting. As shooting along the skirmish line began, Lee saw these men bowed in prayer. He instantly dismounted, uncovered his head, and devoutly joined in the simple worship. The rest of the party followed his example, and those humble privates found themselves leading the devotions of their loved and honored General Lee. Lee's son, Rooney, was imprisoned at Fort Monroe. And on December 26th, Lee received a horrifying telegram announcing the death of Rooney's wife, Charlotte. Lee wrote Mary, It has pleased God to take from us one exceedingly dear to us, and we must be resigned to his holy will. What a glorious thought it is that she has joined her little cherubs and our angel Annie in heaven. Thus, link by link is the strong chain broken that binds us to earth and smooths our passage to another world. Lee also wrote to his son. How I mourn her loss, but my grief is for ourselves, not for her. She is brighter and happier than ever, safe from all evil and awaiting us in her heavenly abode. May God in his mercy enable us to join her in eternal praise to our Lord and Savior. May 29, 1864, after spending five days trying to dislodge the Confederates from their positions, Grant moved his army southeast around Lee's right flank. But Lee responded quickly, and on May 31st, Grant moved yet further southwards to an isolated crossroads called Cold Harbor. So called because the restaurant there did not serve hot meals. Cold Harbor was only nine miles from Richmond. While the Southerners prepared a new line of defense, Grant threw his tired troops against them, but was again rebuffed. He decided on one more all-out attack. The assault was to be one of the most costly of the war. In half an hour, Grant suffered 7,000 casualties, nearly five times those of the South. It was the fastest rate of killing in any Civil War battle. Bodies were stacked up in front of the rebel trenches like cordwood, and the firing was so severe that Lee later remarked that it had sounded like sheets ripping in the wind. It was aptly said that this was not war, but murder. The South had won one of its easiest victories, while the North had suffered one of its heaviest and most pointless defeats. Grant's determination had turned into his bloodiest mistake. He acquired the reputation of being Butcher Grant, ironically from the lips of many of the same people who had recently been praising him to the skies. Most everyone agreed, North and South, that he was no match for Robert E. Lee. August 1864. After the fall of Atlanta, the infamous Northern General William Tecumseh Sherman declared war on the civilian population of the South. He proclaimed that women and children must be made to feel the war as heavily as the soldier in the field. Thousands of Southerners died as a result of the deliberate shelling of civilian targets, the blockade of civilian medical supplies, and the burning of civilian homes. Starvation became prevalent, 
because of the deliberate destruction of civilian food supplies. Sherman continued burning virtually everything from Atlanta to the sea in a 60 mile wide by 300 mile long path. Sherman and his army destroyed homes, schools, churches, and entire communities. Today, you can fly over this region and see the patterns of growth and buildings that outline Sherman's devastating march path. Scores of Negro women were viciously assaulted by regiments of Yankees. White women, likewise, were left to the mercy of unbridled Yankee soldiers, while their husbands and fathers were dying on the war front. As he marched through Georgia, scores of blacks followed him. Pontoon bridges were used to get his army across the many rivers. After taking up the bridges, many blacks were stranded on the other side, where they were captured. In her diary, Mary Chestnut called Sherman a nightmare, a ghoul, and a hyena. An officer under Sherman's command wrote of his disgust in a letter. I tell you the truth when I say that we are about as mean a mob as ever walked the face of the earth. It is perfectly frightful. If I lived in this country, I never would lay down my arms while a Yankee remained on the soil. I do not blame Southerners for being secessionists now. I could relate many things that would be laughable if they were not so horribly disgraceful. Sherman's march to the sea was in sharp contrast to Lee's Pennsylvania campaign where he issued the following order to his army. The commanding general considers that no greater disgrace could befall the army than the perpetration of the barbarous outrages upon the innocent and defenseless and the wanton destruction of private property that have marked the course of the enemy in our own country. It must be remembered that we make war only upon armed men. We cannot take vengeance for the wrongs our people have suffered without lowering ourselves in the eyes of all whose abhorrence has been excited by the atrocities of our enemy, and defending against him to whom vengeance belongs, without whose favor and support our efforts must prove in vain. When Lee took 75,000 men into Pennsylvania, renowned historian Clifford Dowdy wrote that not a single house was burned in the enemy's land. A British observer made note of the good behavior of the Southern troops, writing that he saw none of the inhabitants disturbed or annoyed by the soldiers. During the final year of the war, there was much despair. However, one thing had become clear. Robert Edward Lee now symbolized more than anyone or anything else the whole of the Confederate cause. His health during this period was relatively good and he remained active at his various headquarters around Petersburg. Walter Taylor wrote, It is quite trying to accompany the general to church or any public place. Everybody crowds the way and stops to have a look. Revival in the Southern armies continued until the very end of the war. Even in the early months of 1865, as the desperate struggle around Petersburg, Virginia drew to a close, preaching services took place twice every Sunday for the soldiers. January 1865, the end finally came for Confederate officials and their families in Richmond. Led by Davis, they fled southward by train. An evacuation fire that was meant to burn military supplies raged out of control, ultimately burning one-third of the city. A servant in front of a house where the fire seemed to be headed hailed a Union aid. When the aid stopped, he was met by a lady who stated that her mother was an invalid and was confined to her bed. Since the fire was approaching, she explained her need for assistance. In the subsequent conversation, he discovered that the invalid was no other than Mary, the wife of General Robert E. Lee. And the lady who addressed the aide was her daughter. Two Union soldiers guarded them until all danger was past. Exhausted from poor supplies and lack of sleep, 
Lee and his remaining 50,000 men headed south. But Grant intercepted the possible retreat routes and cut off the much needed supplies. Lee's army marched west toward Farmville where they would find rations. On April 6th at Sailor's Creek, the Yankees caught up with Lee's rear guard and took 8,000 prisoners, including six general officers, among them Lee's son Custis and Richard Ewell. Lee then spoke the words which signaled the end of the conflict. There is nothing left for me to do but go and see General Grant, and I would rather die a thousand deaths. The famous meeting between Lee and Grant took place on Palm Sunday, April 9th, 1865. The location was the Wilmer McLean House in the tiny village of Appomattox Courthouse. Lee had been up since 3 a.m. He dressed in his finest and last gray uniform and then mounted traveler. Sergeant G.W. Tucker carried a white flag and Colonel Charles Marshall rode along as an aide. Union General Officer Joshua Chamberlain described his first vision of Lee. I turned about and there behind me, riding in between my two lines, appeared a commanding form, superbly mounted, richly accoutred, with expression of deep sadness, overmastered by deeper strength. It was no other than Robert E. Lee. I sat immovable with a certain awe and admiration. It was about 1.30 in the afternoon before Grant arrived. He had not slept. His clothes were soiled and dusty and his boots were mud spattered. The surrender interview lasted until about 3.45 p.m. The federal commander offered generous terms, allowing all Confederates to be paroled and return home, keeping their horses, sidearms, and baggage. After signing the surrender papers, Lee shook hands with Grant and walked out onto the porch. Federal officers immediately came to attention and saluted Lee. Lee returned the salute and mounted Traveler. As he rode quietly down the lane, he passed into view of his men. In an instant, they were about him, with tears flowing down their faces. One of the Southern soldiers, William Blackford, wrote his parents. When the soldiers saw General Lee approaching, there was a general rush from each side of the road to greet him as he passed and two solid walls of men were formed along the whole distance. Wild, heartfelt cheers arose, which so touched General Lee that tears filled his eyes and trickled down his cheeks as he rode, hat in hand, bowing his acknowledgments. Lee wrote an official letter to the troops. I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend to you his blessing and protection. I bid you an affectionate farewell. On April 12th, Lee returned to his house in Richmond. A few days after his return, the celebrated Yankee photographer Matthew Brady convinced the general to pose for a series of photographs on the rear porch of the Lee house. His son Custis and his aide Walter Taylor joined Lee in the photo session. Walter Taylor had joined Lee's staff in the spring of 1861 and remained with him throughout the war. He was in closer daily contact with Lee than any other officer and was with him at Appomattox. He rose to the grade of Lieutenant Colonel. At the close of the war, offers of financial assistance poured upon him from all quarters but he steadfastly refused them. An insurance company offered him their presidency at a salary of $10,000 a year. When he declined the offer, they replied, but General, you need not perform any duties. We simply want the use of your name. That will abundantly compensate us. Excuse me, sir, 
I cannot consent to receive pay for services I do not render. My good name is about all that I have saved from the wreck of the war, and that is not for sale. Dear Mary, life is indeed gliding away, and I have nothing good to show for mine that is past. I pray I may be spared to accomplish something for the benefit of mankind and the honor of God. God answered Lee's prayer. The Board of Trustees at a little school named Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, offered him the college presidency. He accepted in early September and began plans to move his family to the charming little town of Lexington, where Stonewall Jackson lay buried. During General Lee's administration of five years, the college expanded from 146 students the first year to 344 students the fifth. The prosperity of the college was due to his influence and had attracted young men from every state. But the trustees were always faced with the refusal of General Lee to receive a salary beyond what he conceived the college could afford. His salary of $1,500 per year was modest in comparison to some ex-generals on both sides who capitalized on their fame. They simply wanted to compensate him for his invaluable service. But his firm reply was always the same. My salary is as large as the college ought to pay. He urged that a chapel be built on the campus. There were other objects that required a great outlay of money, but he deemed the chapel of great importance. The building was completed in time for June 1868 commencement exercises. Lee's office was in the basement, and he worshipped upstairs daily. The Reverend Struther Jones told the following story. On one occasion, I noticed that Lee was deeply affected after his daily prayers in the chapel. I asked, what's the matter, General? To which he replied, I was thinking of my responsibility to Almighty God for these hundreds of young men. On another occasion, Professor Thomas Kirkpatrick had a conversation with Lee. We had been conversing for some time respecting the religious welfare of the students. General Lee's feelings soon became so intense that for a time his utterance was choked. But recovering himself, with his eyes overflowing with tears, his lips quivering with emotion, he exclaimed, Oh, doctor, if I could only know that all the young men in this college were good Christians, I should have nothing more to desire. The trustees were anxious to build a residence for him, but he insisted that other buildings were needed far more than a new house for himself. The trustees finally made the appropriation without his knowledge. He then supervised the building himself, reducing its cost considerably. The house featured a first floor bedroom and a porch that was built on three sides for Mary so that she could enjoy greater mobility in her wheelchair. The Lees were careful to speak of it, not as their own, but as the president's house. One of the university faculty had been criticizing General Grant with some harsh words. General Lee told him emphatically, Sir, if you ever presume again to speak disrespectfully of General Grant in my presence, either you or I will sever his connection with this university. Lee's Christian character was so highly regarded in England that several English admirers sent him a Bible. He wrote them a letter of acknowledgment. The Bible is a book in comparison with which all others in my eyes are of minor importance, and which in all my perplexities has never failed to give me light and strength. He accepted the presidency of the Rockbridge Bible Society and continued to discharge its duties until the time of his death. In an address in 1869, Chaplain William Jones stated that the great need of our colleges was a genuine, pervasive revival, and that it could only come from God. At the close of the meeting, General Lee came to him. 
I wish, sir, to thank you for your address. It was just what we needed. My great desire is a revival that brings these young men to Christ. We poor sinners need to come back from our wanderings to seek pardon through the all-sufficient merits of our Redeemer. And we need to pray earnestly for the power of the Holy Spirit to give us a precious revival in our hearts and among the unconverted. Dr. William Jones relates the following story. One day in the autumn of 1869, I saw General Lee talking to a humbly clad man. Later when I inquired to his identity, the general said, that was one of our soldiers. I took it for granted that he meant it was a Confederate veteran and asked to what command he belonged. General Lee pleasantly responded, he fought on the other side, but we must not remember that against him now. The man afterward came to my house and said, Sir, he is the noblest man that ever lived. He not only had a kind word for an old soldier who fought against him, but he gave me some money to help me on my way. During the summer months, Lee's rheumatism became more bothersome. On September 28, 1870, he walked home in a downpour of rain after a routine day. Mary, confined to a wheelchair, smiled and teased her husband. You have kept us waiting a long time. Where have you been? Lee did not answer. He took his place at the table and stood to say grace. The effort was in vain. The lips could not utter the prayer of the heart. Finding himself unable to speak, he quietly took his seat. The doctor was called, and Lee was put to bed in front of a living room window where he had liked to sit and look out. The following week, a storm beat across the countryside. But Lee was not aware of the prolonged storm. His mind had gone free, past the ramparts of rain and flood. When his son, General Custis Lee, made some allusion to his recovery, he shook his head and pointed upward. The end came on the morning of October 12th, 1870. At his bedside were his wife, Mary, son, Custis, and daughters, Agnes and Mildred. Lee's voice suddenly filled the room. Strike the tent. Tell Hill he must come up. Lee had given his last order to move on. The great commander closed his eyes and his soul passed peacefully from Earth. He was 63 years old. Mary died three years later at age 65. Robert E. Lee was buried beneath the chapel and in 1883 re-entombed in the Lee family crypt inside Lee Chapel. At his burial, the congregation sang his favorite hymn, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. Irish orator said, the solitude of George Washington was broken as Lee crossed the threshold of heaven. Chaplain J. William Jones said, if I have ever come in contact with a sincere, devout Christian, one who seeing himself to be a sinner, trusted alone in the merits of Christ, that man was General Robert E. Lee. The London Standard wrote, truer greatness, a loftier nature, a spirit more merciful, a character purer, more chivalrous, the world has rarely, if ever known. The New York Herald wrote, he came nearer the ideal of a soldier and Christian general than any man we can think of. 
and the Washington College student newspaper wrote, he died as he lived, calmly and quietly, in the full assurance of the Christian faith, and with the brightest evidence that in passing over the river, he has rested under the shade of the trees of paradise. Even Northern officers began to sing the praises of General Lee. John C. Ropes wrote, no commander on either side was so universally believed in and so absolutely trusted, nor was there ever a commander who better deserved the support of his government and the affection of his soldiers. The year following Lee's death, the name of Washington College was changed to Washington and Lee University. In that same year, Lee's son Custis succeeded his father as president and he served in that capacity for 26 years. Rooney recovered from wounds he received during the war and served as president of the Virginia Agricultural Society. In 1887, he was elected to Congress, serving until his death in 1891. Rob died in 1914. None of Lee's four daughters ever married. Great military leaders would continue to journey from Europe to the United States to study firsthand the tactics Lee had used against better equipped and more numerous forces. They praised him as the greatest military genius of the century. One military man said, Lee's campaigns of 1862 are, quote, supreme in conception and have not been surpassed as examples of strategy by any other commander in history." End of quote. Not long after the war, a northern soldier told of meeting Lee in the field at Gettysburg. In the opinion of the producer of this documentary, nothing exemplifies the character of Robert E. Lee better than his story. I have been a most bitter anti-South man and fought and cursed the Confederates desperately. I could see nothing good in any of them. The last day of the fight, I was badly wounded as a ball had shattered my left leg. I lay on the ground not far from Cemetery Ridge, and as General Lee ordered his retreat, he and his officers rode near me. As they came along, I recognized him. And though faint from exposure and loss of blood, I raised my hands and looked Lee in the face and shouted as loud as I could, Hurrah for the Union! Hurrah for the Union! The general heard me, looked, stopped his horse, dismounted, and came toward me. I confess I at first thought he meant to kill me. But as he came up, he looked down at me with such a sad expression on his face that all fear left me, and I wondered what he was about. He extended his hand to me, grasping mine firmly, and looking right into my eyes, said, My son, I hope you will soon be well. If I live a thousand years, I shall never forget the expression on General Lee's face. There he was, defeated, retiring from a field that had cost him and his cause almost their last hope, and yet he stopped to say words like these to a wounded soldier of the opposition who had taunted him as he passed by. As soon as the general left me, I cried myself to sleep there on the bloody ground. <laughs> 